consultation with others, all with honest attention not only to the rational reasons, pro and con, but also to the realm of one's feelings, emotions, and desires, what Ignatius called movements of soul, in that quotation. Just one example from my own life. I made a decision in my senior year of high school after absorbing the world of the Sisters of Charity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the order of sisters who taught me in Our Lady of Peace High School, that I was being called to enter religious life. After prayer, reflection, and some cons consultation with others, I did so on July 31st, 1961. You Ignatian types will recognize that date as the Feast of St. Ignatius. On November 5th, 1963, I left the convent after a similar process of discernment for the same reasons I entered. I felt I was being called, but this time to leave the convent without knowing exactly what the next steps would be. But those two plus years in religious life were pivotal for me in laying a foundation for my spiritual life, a point I would return to shortly. Those of you who know some history of the 60s will know that just shortly I, after I left the convent, President John Kennedy was assassinated. It was November 22nd of 1963. And for those of us who experienced that horrific event, it is etched in our hearts and minds. And while the swirl of political events continued, I became more engaged with the major church event of that period, the Second Vatican Council which had begun in 1962 and would end in 1965. What a treasure trove of ideas and visions. While there are many, the one that has stayed close to my heart is the opening lines of the great pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, Gaudi and Spets, and I quote, the joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the people of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted, these, too, are the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Indeed, nothing genuinely human fails to raise an echo in their hearts." Unquote. The document came out in December of 1965. I was at the University of Minnesota. In 1965 was a pivotal year for our country. The Civil Rights Movement was challenging the status quo, and in the spring of that year, there was a call for a third march to Selma, Alabama. I was the co-chair of the Student Association's Human Relations Committee. We debated long and hard about whether we should go to that march, and in the end, decided not to. But our advisor challenged us, not a problem with that decision, but just exactly what were we going to do about racism. My co-chair and I decided to organize a trip to Chicago for students to learn more about that city and its struggles. A pivotal experience for me because it was there that I realized something about myself. While my mind was liberated from racism, my heart was not. It happened simply enough. One of the hosts invited me to attend a gathering of the Amistad Society. Of course, I had no idea what that was, and having taken a couple of years of Latin, I figured it was about friendship. <laughs> so I go with the host, who by the way was African American, and we come to an apartment building, walk up a couple of flights, and enter rooms. I wasn't there more than 30 seconds when I realized I was the only white person in the room, a first for me. And then what happened? I panicked. My heart raced. I thought, my God, I've got to get out of here. But of course, my host introduced me to a lot of people, and they asked about the trip and what I was doing, and the conversations began. It was just fine. But I learned a lesson for the struggle for justice. It isn't just what's in the mind, good ideas, telling concepts, knowledge of history. It's what's in the heart and in the emotions. I believe that if we can't educate the heart, we can't make substantial change. And that leads to a related idea, namely solidarity. Peter Hans Kolvenbach, the former Superior General of the Society of Jesus, talked about it this way, and I quote, we must therefore raise our Jesuit educational standard to educate the whole person of solidarity for the real world. Solidarity is learned through contact rather than through concepts. When the heart is touched by direct experience, the mind may be challenged to change. Personal involvement with innocent suffering, with the injustice others suffer, is the catalyst for solidarity, which then gives rise to intellectual inquiry and moral reflection. 
students in the course of their formation must let the gritty reality of this world into their lives so they can learn to feel it, think about it critically, respond to its suffering, and engage it constructively. They should learn to perceive, think, judge, choose, and act for the rights of others, especially the disadvantaged and the oppressed. End of quotation. And finally, in this section on justice, a key inspiration for me in my belief that the call to justice is an essential one comes from the document of the Synod of Bishops in 1971, Justicia Mundo, Justice in the World, and I quote, action on behalf of justice and participation in the transformation of the world fully appear to us as a constitutive dimension of the preaching of the gospel, or in other words, of the church's mission for the redemption of the human race and its liberation from every oppressive situation, end quote. So I see the call to justice as essential, both abstractly and personally. I believe it is part of what it means to be human. Whether that idea comes from faith, which it does for me, or from a deep humanism, as it does for others, it is essential. You've heard some of my inspiration for that. For the humanists among us, it is often rooted in a document such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that seminal document signed by the General Assembly of the United Nations on December 10, 1948. My favorite article is Article 25, and I think it provides the aspiration and inspiration. I quote, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of themselves and of their family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond their control." End quotation. For me, then, this call to justice is intimately tied to the essential call to prayer, which is the topic of my second section. In the Gospel of Luke, we find the command to pray always. I used to wonder what that meant, I still do, but I discovered that one important way for me to enter into that possibility was namely to begin each day with meditation. How did I come to this? As I mentioned earlier, my time in the convent was crucial for laying a foundation for my spiritual life. It was during that time that I really first learned to meditate, and the type of meditation that we practiced was very Ignatian that is rooted in the use of the imagination to place myself in different scenes where I think, reflect, talk, engage in a dialogue of a kind with Jesus or Mary, for example. When I left the convent, I found myself doing other kinds of prayer, but I really did not continue meditation. Who knows why? It was in 1987, in a bookstore outside of London, that I discovered a little pamphlet on mindfulness which led me to the great Vietnamese Buddhist monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, paying attention to eating an orange, or listening when a bell rings, or breathing in and out while I focused on the very process. No ideas to me. I continued to read more and do what I would call mini meditations of mindfulness, I like alliteration besides, for several years after that. But it wasn't until my sister invited me to make a retreat with her in 1995 that I began to do more than many meditations squeezed into a busy day. I was attracted to what my sister was doing, centering prayer, most often associated with Father Thomas Keaton. From then until I came to Georgetown, that is the kind of meditation I did daily. But here I met Dennis McCullough, who was my walking partner when I first arrived. We literally walked at 6 a.m. in the morning along the canal. It's beautiful there, and at that time of day, in all seasons, try it. Dennis told me about a meditating group he had started at the chapel of St. Ignatius at Holy Trinity on Thursdays following the 5.30 Mass, and he invited me to attend. That was the beginning of what I now know as Christian meditation, as suggested by the World Community for Christian Meditation. I think what drew me and continues to draw me is the simplicity of this form of meditation. As many of you, perhaps most of you, know, the recommendation is to use a mantra, and the one that the world community suggests is Madra Natha, the Aramaic term for something like, come O Lord, or come Lord Jesus. I discovered